Hello and welcome to episode 71 of Wealth Talk. My name's Christian Rodwell, the Membership Director for Wealth Builders. And this week we are bringing you a bonus episode and it's a recording of the Wealth Builders ebook, which was written a couple of years back by Kevin Whelan and is narrated by Lex McKee. Now we're having a bit of a quiet down month in August, but we thought we'd share the ebook because whilst it is available through the Wealth Builders website, as an ebook version, the audio is not so easy to get hold of. So we thought we would make this accessible as one of our podcast episodes, and that makes it easy for you to share as well. So if you've been enjoying listening to Wealth Talk in the past 70 episodes, then why not share this ebook with someone who would appreciate it? So click on your podcasting app and the share button and send this to someone who you think would really value learning about the wealth builders process. At the end of the ebook, there's a call to action and it's a simple call to download and sign our declaration of financial independence. So if you commit and resonate with our values and you want to commit to your own financial independence, then download a copy by heading over to wealthbuilders.co.uk forward slash declaration and you can share that with your friends, with your family and if you feel bold, even share it on social media and inside the Wealth Builders Facebook group. Anyway, enjoy listening and we'll catch you back in September. Wealth Builders, the new blueprint for complete financial independence in the 21st century by Kevin Whelan. Blown away by the blueprint, Lex McKee's forward to the series of books on wealth building. When I first interviewed Kevin Whelan about his process for building wealth, I was blown away by the beauty of his blueprint. Here was a design for life that was accessible, understandable, and above all, applicable immediately. I was convinced that anyone could get it, and therefore that everyone could get wealth. Everyone could become a wealth builder. And I was partially right. The truth is that becoming a real wealth builder requires a certain commitment Kevin had demonstrated this in his own life and continues to do so now as a mentor for others. It requires that rare person who will read beyond the first chapter of a business book, who will find the relevance for themselves and who will take action consistently. One of Kevin's sayings is now part of my everyday consciousness. Never let a month go by without building wealth. If I share a brief overview of Kevin's blueprint, I think you might just be one of those types who will reap the benefits of this scientific process that has all the beauty of a work of art. The detail is in the book, but let me share what might be described as the lid of the jigsaw. The power of eight. The blueprint, our logo for it, looks like the Pantheon with seven solid pillars. This, it turns out, is good news. There are only seven assets to think about. With the frame of the foundation and the roof, that gives the aspiring wealth builder just eight major areas to consider when making their own plans for financial independence or for their dream life of financial abundance. The foundation deals with becoming financially smart. Four types of smart help get the wealth builder on the up escalator to financial security. They are being debt smart, which is about managing debt so that it serves a purpose. On some occasions, the return on investment makes the cost of investment worthwhile. Most of the time, however, a wealth builder can get the best return on investment by being completely debt free. Being tax smart recognises that there is a tax overlay on every asset being built. Understanding how to use tax advantageously is a key aspect of financial intelligence. Being bill smart is equally about taking advantage of an increasingly competitive market. With some diligence, the wealth builder can make huge savings, which can then be applied to the serious business of building more wealth. Finally, being insure smart means that wherever you are in your personal journey of building wealth, your overall plan is secured. Kevin's insights into these aspects of financial intelligence made the blueprint worthwhile for me since we all have to manage our liabilities. All this wonderful architecture of wealth crumbles, however, without the right roof. 
Kevin's frame is complete in my mind because it covers the ways to protect your assets, your future, and the future for your family. Just understanding the deliberate combination of your will, power of attorney, and trusts was a real revelation. Kevin summarizes the aspect of the frame with three L's, legal, legacy, and legend. Legal is the documentation that makes managing your estate easier, your will, for example, the way you own assets and your trusts. Legacy is how your wealth is passed on to those causes and people you care about. And legend, the enduring contribution you make to the world. History is littered with examples of generations who have wasted the wealth built by the generation before. For this reason, the educational aspect of passing on your financial wisdom to your family is vital to the establishment of a dynasty of ethical wealth builders. This is the age of intellectual property. It's never been easier to pass on your wisdom to others, to live and communicate your own legend. Filling the frame, the power of the pillars. As I said, the frame really was an eye-opener for me, but the education leapt to a higher level when Kevin explained to me the heart of the wealth-building process, the ownership of assets, which Kevin refers to as pillars. There are seven, and only seven of these. The first is home equity, but I discovered that almost nobody turns their home into an asset. Instead, it's usually a liability until it's sold or downsized at retirement. With the right strategy, you could be living in a gold mine. The second pillar rarely fills people with excitement. Pensions. There is probably no other asset that is so misunderstood or underutilised. So don't be surprised if you get excited about your pensions, perhaps for the first time ever, when you discover through the series of books how pensions can become a source of funding in the here and now. Pillar 3, investments, will get you more engaged with the strategies Kevin shares to protect your investments against loss. With the stock market in such a volatile state, this will boost your confidence again in the value of having stocks and shares as part of your sevenfold strategy. Pillar 4, property portfolio, will encourage you to think outside the box, the box being the all-too-obvious route of buying to let. In a later book in this series, Kevin will reveal the secrets of how to achieve much higher return on investment on property. You'll love it. Pillar 5, business, may well cause you to re-evaluate the worth of any current businesses you own. This pillar will create a fresh appreciation of why anyone should be in business. It's a timely reminder of why the business owner needs to work on their business rather than in it. There's no higher return on investment than running your own business. Pillar six, intellectual property is the one pillar I've always been in love with. I discovered, though, that my own intellectual property was underperforming unnecessarily. Kevin unveiled ways to monetize my ideas that I'd never considered. Same ideas yet higher return on investment. Now that's smart thinking. If you're passionate about a subject, you'll enjoy developing this through the pillar of intellectual property. The seventh pillar turns out to be the keystone of the blueprint for many, joint ventures. Joint ventures empower you to work with others towards a mutually beneficial goal. Too many of us are loners in business, following what some call the rugged individual paradigm. And by paradigm, I mean a pattern of thinking or behaving. It used to be cool to be a self-made man or a self-made woman. I discovered, though, that being this kind of cool is really like being a fool in the 21st century. None of us needs to build wealth alone anymore. And in fact, Kevin will argue that it is impossible to build sufficient wealth using the pioneering ways of the 20th century. The new pioneers build together. The forthcoming joint venture book will show you how to build relationships you can trust and how to structure a win-win agreement so that you can have confidence in any venture. Joint ventures and the mentoring they require are at the heart of the growing community of wealth builders, a shared journey to financial independence. Let me conclude my forward to the introductory book in Kevin's series. This is a book with a story. Kevin is who he is and does what he does because of a positive response to a challenge that became the turning point in his life. This is no sob story or tale of rags to riches, but when you hear his story, you'll understand how adversity can become a catalyst, if 
you have the mindset of a wealth builder. What will be your story? What results will emerge for you as you travel through this blueprint? I believe you are in for a massive personal paradigm shift. You may find along the way that you too begin to see yourself as a wealth builder on an exciting journey with others. Whether you're an employee who wants to create independence from the need to work, a property expert who needs greater leverage, or perhaps a business owner looking for a new source of finance to help your business really grow, I trust that you will seek to engage with this new pioneering community of the financially independent-minded. I recommend Kevin's book because I think that any reader who takes action will find their wealth transformed for the better. Part 1. Setting the scene. Let's define wealth. Wealth as a noun. An abundance of valuable possessions or money. The state of being rich. An abundance or profusion of something desirable. And let's define builder, also a noun. A person who constructs by putting parts or materials together. A person able to take a resource and increase it in size or intensity over time. A person who is able to use a resource as a basis for further progress or development. And our unique definition of a wealth builder, a new noun, a person of high integrity committed to financial independence through sharing with like-minded people and who leaves a great legacy. Here is Kevin's story in his own words. My own catalyst for becoming a wealth builder and for writing this series of books was deeply significant. In 1985, when I was just 25, my father died. Tragically, he was only 46. He was a North Sea oil worker who had a heart attack on a rig. Back in 1985, my father didn't have the opportunities that exist now. They couldn't take him off the rig or care for him in the ways possible today. He died on that rig. My father's death impacted me in many ways on many levels. Genetically, we were cut from the same cloth. We were the same height. We even walked and talked the same. Whilst we weren't exactly peas in a pod, we were pretty close. At 25, I simply sought to get over the tragedy. But I needed to move forward and carve out a career for myself. I was seeking to build some momentum. As a young economist, I knew something about finance, but didn't really know what I wanted to do. Then the thought struck me. What if I go at the same age? What if that genetic cloth is cut the same way for me too. What should I do? In a period of reflection, I decided I would have to change my financial future. I was getting married in 1989 and I realised I couldn't possibly leave the kind of legacy that I wanted to. I couldn't possibly save enough after tax to care for my wife and future family if I wasn't there. I needed a new paradigm, a fresh strategy. As well as the tragedy of an early death, my father died without a will. He died leaving the family in debt. That was clearly not his intention. So the situation acted as a powerful catalyst in my life, and I resolved not to be the same. I found my motivation. I realised that I couldn't achieve what I wanted to by working for a living. I had to build something that had ongoing value. This is when the seeds of the ideas began to germinate into what later became the full wealth building process. One key idea was the difference between working for a living as opposed to building things that pay you, between work income and asset income. Education is at the heart of everything that motivates me. The foundation of my approach was to train in finance. I got a financial education. I figured that the best way to deal with these issues was to teach myself. I became my own mentor. Trained by a major UK financial institution, I got the inside track on how money really worked. Fueled by the growth in home ownership and a massive desire to produce something of value, I went on to build a mortgage-broking business. I created this unique concept. We don't do mortgages, we eliminate them. I paid off my own mortgage in super fast time. Then I wrote the book on how to do that, save a fortune fast, because I proved it could be done. I became an expert. 
This is when I really began to invest in my own intellectual property. The deliberate focus was always to build things, on asset income rather than work income. The balance was tough, but it paid off. My catalyst was so strong. So let's define a catalyst, another noun, a substance that increases the rate of a chemical reaction, a person or thing that precipitates an event. Asset income comes from assets. It flows into your bank account while you're asleep. It is permanent income. You can pass it on. Work income, on the other hand, comes from your activities. It is trading time for money. It ceases when you are not there. You cannot pass it on. Work income is, by definition, work. It's often hard work. Moving from a work income mindset to an asset income mindset is called a paradigm shift. It's a bit like reading upside down or turning the book round. It requires a complete shift of perspective. My definition of an asset is unique. It will influence the assessment of the value of all seven assets. So let me state it in full. An asset is something you own that is not you. It puts money into your bank account while you are asleep. And you can pass that money on to the people you care about or good causes. It does not end because you are not there. Creating wealth by building assets is motivating and enjoyable. It takes work, but that work is rewarding and energising. It gets easier and easier. In fact, it's as simple as ABC. Assets build cash flow. By the age of 45, that's one year younger than when my father died, I was financially independent. My assets had created the cash flow I needed to live the life I wanted. What I discovered next was very exciting. I found my ability to build wealth just accelerated. It was like being on an up escalator, getting further up and ahead was easy. I now want to be an accelerator for others. What I do now flows from a position of financial abundance. That's true financial freedom. Now my life is more to do with the transference of wisdom, being a mentor to those who are hungry for alternatives. The lessons that I learned can be shared. I can help others learn and apply these lessons at an accelerated pace because over the last 25 years, I've developed a CAT scan-like ability to diagnose the financial health of anyone. So that's why I do what I do. My catalyst was tragic, but it changed my life. Most people never get a wake-up call. I'd like this message to be yours. So what's your why? Without a catalyst, nothing worthwhile happens. Wealth building without a strong why is virtually impossible. So what is your why? This is such a fundamental question that I'm going to invite you to press pause right now. I have two questions for you at this point. What does wealth mean to you? How would you define wealth? And why is building wealth important to you? Without a big enough why, you'll find reasons to quit if the going gets tough. But having a huge why will be your catalyst that will drive your motivation. It's part of your story. I've shared with you my story, my catalyst, my motivation. Now we must reflect on your story and write the next chapters of it together. They're in ten or they're in five. I'm trusting that if you're still listening, it means that financial freedom is an important part of your future story. It took me 15 years to reach the state of financial independence. Now I've learned some more lessons. I had a good foundation and developed some useful intelligence from being an economist. This experience has been priceless. Part of my story was being my own mentor, learning by trial and error. This book and your future story is very much focused on the value of having the right mentors at the right time. I now have my own mentors to facilitate the way I grow my wealth in areas which are not my speciality. I'm not claiming to be the mentor, just a suitable one for the purpose of this message. I understand all seven assets. I've made connections over the last 25 years with experts who are masters in their field. When you're ready, I can introduce you to mentors in each pillar, fellow wealth builders who will accelerate the process for you. The result is that I can now teach you how to become completely financially independent within 10 years. 
Or, if you're really up for it, I can teach you to get there in five years. To achieve this, I formed the structure to accelerate the process. The seven, and only seven assets that generate wealth, a community of wealth builders, mentors with integrity and expertise, and a financial GPS system to keep you on track. This unique structure, built upon the principles of integrity and sharing, is all you'll need to get to financial independence and beyond. The way forward is the cooperative way of the community. Not just a group of people who travel on the same journey, but rather a community of people who share values and who share skills and lessons. Being part of a community of people who work together towards shared goals is energising and empowering. It's the way of the future. So let's finish this first section of my story with a couple of further questions to drive you forward on your journey. Now that you can decide to become financially independent in as little as five years, I'd like you to reflect on the progress you've made over the last five years. Consider the two following questions. Firstly, what major steps have you taken in the past five years to generate wealth? Secondly, how much of your current time are you spending on income generation rather than wealth building activities? I hope that made you think. Like I said, I want this book to be your catalyst. So if you need a catalyst to be a wealth builder, if you need a bigger why, continue listening. Now and then, three dramatic shifts. As an economist, I've been a keen student of economic history. Let's give you a quick historical perspective to help with your understanding of how to build wealth in the 21st century. The major changes in wealth have been obvious. In fact, there have been three dramatic shifts. Firstly, landed gentry to industrialists, what we call the Industrial Revolution. Secondly, industrialists to individuals, the Social Revolution. And thirdly, individuals to wealth builders, the Community Revolution. The Industrial Revolution. In the Industrial Revolution, there was a major shift in wealth from landowners to industrialists. A new breed of entrepreneurs invented products and processes that transformed the world. Work practices were changed forever too, as factories which housed hundreds of people were a magnet attracting droves from the country to the cities. It was a radical transformation in economic culture and wealth. The UK was the powerhouse behind it all. The social revolution. As companies grew, created by industrialists, the benefits of wealth began to percolate down to more and more workers. In fact, the development of the concept of companies created the concept of shares. Workers could become shareholders, buying a share in the value of the company they worked for or in any other company they chose. Unlike today... Back then, shares were a reflection of the value of the company. The market to trade shares in these new companies grew too. As companies expanded and employment grew, the future security of the workers became more closely linked to the success of the company. Increasingly, employers provided a pension in return for long-term employment. It was not unusual for an individual to work their entire life for the same firm. Financial security came at retirement. Workers gave their pound of flesh in exchange for long-term security. This was the trade-off. You collected your carriage clock to reflect on the time you'd given the company, and you retired. For most, retirement was a relief, though life expectancy was not long. With the emergence of the state pension, the increase in the concept of home ownership and a nest egg with the bank, life was safe. In order to achieve a decent level of security, you didn't really have to be that smart. You didn't need to build anything. You just needed to turn up for work. Now you can't. Those days have gone. The community revolution. A shift is happening now that is every bit as dramatic as the changes of the industrial and social revolutions. These changes will affect you. So let's take note. There are key distinctions between now And then, in the 20th century, financial security was dependent upon the stability offered by a job for life and by the employer. The introduction of state benefits made the situation even more stable. 
Now we have a triple whammy that's destabilised and changed everything. Historic change number one. Final salary pension schemes offered a secure foundation for income in retirement. That was the past. Now the foundations have crumbled, highlighting the need for alternative types of pensions and a broader financial strategy. Final salary pension schemes have been a great way to build security for a good retirement for many, not any more. The first punch is the demise of final salary pension schemes. Those in the military, civil service, politicians, public sector employees and a few fortunate others still have this solid foundation paid for by the taxpayer or by the employer. Moreover, there is no need for the individual to be involved in taking decisions about risk and there is no commitment beyond turning up for work. For everyone else, this safe pension has either gone or is going fast. The foundations are crumbling. For those outside the comfort of final salary pension schemes, there is the prevalence of stock market-based pensions, where the final pension depends upon an increasingly volatile stock market and historically low annuity rates. Whereas formerly the risk and the responsibility was mitigated by the employer or the state, now that entire responsibility falls upon the individual. Let's have a look at historic change number two. Formerly a solid state pension at 60 for women and 65 for men. Good days. Now, state pension no longer is solid and it's being pushed back and back and back. The second punch then is successive government's response to the pressure of an ageing population. The pension pot is not bottomless. Benefits must drop or taxes must rise. Living longer already means waiting longer to tap into a state pension. The age has already been revised upward from 65. Wherever that line ends up, a state pension will be insufficient for the majority of us. It's important to realise that this is an issue that is recognised by all parties. It is an issue of economics and demographics, not just of politics. Frankly, if you have to get into the details of what your state pension will be in order to live, you've got the wrong plan. Historic change number three. Annuity rates of 15% were common in 1990. Now annuity rates are at their lowest in history, 5% or less. So here's the knockout third punch, the triple whammy. That's right, annuity rates are at their lowest in history. With the volatility of the stock market giving low returns, many understandably cautious people are falling in to the annuity trap converting their pension funds into an annuity, often of just 5%. Once you've signed up to an annuity, the rate is fixed forever. I call it the annuity trap. An annuity is an annual income payable monthly from a pension pot. Most frequently, this is the income an insurance company agrees to pay out from the funds you've saved in your retirement nest egg. Tumbling from a 15% to a 5% annuity rate means that your money has to work three times as hard than in the past. This means that you will have to save three times as much in order to generate the same level of return available in 1990. What was a good idea then is a bad deal now. The poor value of annuities is always in the press, and for good reason. For most people, they are terrible value for money. An annuity is one of the few things in life that can never change. You can change your name. You can change where you live. You can change your job. You can even surgically change your gender. But once you've agreed to an annuity rate, it is fixed forever. Of course, you can change your future by changing your choices. But as far as an annuity goes, once that choice is made, the future is fixed. There will be more specifically on the annuity trap later in my book on pensions. But I will state the warning again. Annuity rates are at their lowest in history. You need alternatives. The changing economic landscape and its impact on the next generation. Part of the problem behind low annuity rates is the changing nature of the stock market. Stocks used to represent a share in the value of a company. There has been a cultural shift to a more sentimental appraisal of shares. They are worth what people feel they are worth. 
The stock market has thus become as volatile as feelings can be. This creates uncertainty and confusion. The economic landscape has changed forever and will probably never return to earlier forms. We're not to blame. Politics, economics, social and technological trends have all played a part. We do, however, have to pay attention to the changes that are about to impact our children. If you think about it, we are richer than any other generation in history. But the next generation will be poorer than ours. So for the first time in history, the next generation will be poorer than our own. That's a stunning change in the economic, social and cultural landscape. Since education is a key driver of economic change, it's interesting to think about the future for today's students. In the past, through student grants, the state used to fund higher education. Now we have student debt. Many students will enter employment with more than £50,000 of debt. That's a financial millstone by anyone's standards. For many, it's become even harder to get started in work. Youth unemployment is currently over 50% in some European countries. A third of the UK's unemployed youth do not believe they will ever get a job. With student debt projected at being over £50,000, the challenge is clear. We all need a catalyst. The huge growth in payday loan companies is a sad indicator of the nation's attitude to debt. My greatest concern for the future is that students carrying such a burden of debt will find turning to a payday loan company the path of least resistance. Is this the future you want for your children? There has never been a greater need or a better time for you and I to get a financial education. So why don't they teach this in schools? Were you ever taught at school about what it takes to be financially intelligent? Without this education, it is most unlikely that you'll be equipped to make the best choices for your future. By the time our children leave school, practical skills need to have become habit in four main areas. How to manage finances, including understanding debt and cumulative interest, developing the practice of budgeting and learning how to use tax advantageously. Secondly, the crucial difference between investing in liabilities and investing in assets. Both are investments, but the returns are 180 degrees opposite to one another. Thirdly, how to create asset income and thus become a wealth builder. And fourthly, how to protect yourself and your assets and define how these assets will transfer to others in the future. This is exciting, practical and relevant education. No child in their right mind would say yes to a payday loan offer once they've seen for themselves the true scale and impact of cumulative debt interest. This sort of education is a great opportunity for schools to teach why basic mathematics is so important to a student's success in life. It's important for their entire financial future. And I don't remember my maths teacher framing it in this way. So getting started. I was asked by a budding wealth builder, how do you start this process if you've got no money? That's an excellent question and it cuts right to the heart of beginning of financial education. It all starts with a switch, a choice between only two options, choosing liabilities or choosing assets. I was then asked by someone in their early 50s, is it too late? It was great to be able to share with them that I can get them there in five years. I think they're going to live more than five years, so in no way is it too late to start right now. Let's pause for thought about this choice for a moment. Every time you choose an asset, you're choosing a better future. For all wealth builders, there's a point where this fact just clicks. Let me tell you about a technique that will make this distinction a habit for you. I taught one of my wealth building bridge builders, those are the members of our community who introduce other wealth builders to the most appropriate mentors and other connections that were moving forward. So I taught this wealth building bridge builder this straightforward technique. I suggested he actually clicked his fingers when he got out his debit card to pay for anything. He had an addiction to spending that had caused him to amass liabilities rather than build assets. As his mentor, he'd asked me to help him break this habit. I said, when you click your fingers, this will remind you of the choice you have before you, the switch. It will let you pause and think about whether you're investing in a liability or an asset. 
In this way, you will always make a financial decision on purpose. And if it is a liability, you will find you can enjoy that expense more because you know exactly what you're doing. A technique I shared with this bridge builder is called anchoring by professionals who use neuro-linguistic programming to boost their performance. It turns out that since that time, he has used the click technique every time he starts his working day. A right click, almost like using a mouse, was for him building an asset. A left click was used as a self-check that he'd slipped into trading time for money or was spending assets on a liability. He said to me it had become like waking himself out of a spending trance. Each wealth builder's life is a series of deliberate choices. So, this is one of the scientific facts about financial intelligence. There are no neutrals. Anything that keeps that fact at the forefront of your mind is going to help you move forwards. Liabilities are most often a barrier to progress. If your finances were a vehicle to get you to the life you desire, liabilities are the brake and assets are the accelerator. You press one or the other. Stepping on the brake is not always bad, of course. Pausing along the journey to have a celebratory meal with another wealth builder reinforces the point that this is never about penny pinching. This applies to the bigger decisions too. If you're buying a car that reflects your journey, it's a liability. But if you've got a fortune coming in through asset income each month because you've worked the plan, you can say, so what? Rewards at the right time are a hallmark of abundance. If, however, you're still £50,000 in debt, buying that 52-inch flat-screen TV on sale does not make sense to a wealth builder. Enough said. No itacude. That's a strange word. Of course, there's actually a lot of education going on. It's called no itacude. No itacude is education backwards. At the moment, there's a huge amount of education on the value of borrowing, how easy it is, and how it will empower you to have the life you dream of. Lies, lies, and more damn lies. But we let the advertisers get away with it. Like all advertising, this is advice with a vested interest. To combat this, we might benefit from some really good old-fashioned education. The borrower becomes the lender's slave. That's from a book of good management practice that's over 3,000 years old. Somehow that message has got lost. The first part of the proverb actually says unambiguously, the rich rule over the poor. The book is attributed to King Solomon, who historians count both as one of the wisest counsellors that ever lived and reputedly the richest. So our children need to learn how to become debt smart, otherwise they will abdicate control of their lives to others. I am certain that we are agreed that the 21st century demands a good financial education, but no institution consistently provides this. This is madness. In an age of so much opportunity, yet so much debt and financial ignorance, it is the best and worst of times, which reminds me of something. Charles Dickens said, It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. That's from A Tale of Two Cities. Supported by final salary pension schemes, supported by state benefits and high annuity rates, many people would argue that the 20th century was the best of times. I think they're mistaken. Today's changes in the economic landscape have created opportunities as dramatic as the shift from an agricultural to an industrial economy. Even though the next generation and our own are facing such huge challenges, it has never been easier to build wealth. And it's never been harder if you don't know how to do it. Why has it never been easier? You can now have at your fingertips all the information, the education and the technology you could possibly need to make transformational financial decisions. In my opinion, this is the best time of all to be building wealth. It's simply a matter of learning the principles and then consistently applying them. When you learn how to build wealth, it's your money that will do the hard work. You'll just work smarter and you'll become smarter too. Being a wealth builder changes you. Breakthroughs in technology and access to information have made it easier and faster. 
but in the past information was accessible to the fortunate few. Now we have information overload. Now there is a wealth of information. But it's like putting a cup into Niagara Falls to get a drink. With so much information, you'll need a guide to direct you to the right information at the right time. This will help you find new forms of leverage to accelerate your progress, a new force to overcome the gravity holding you in your current financial situation. I'll be sharing more forms of leverage with you in a later publication. It's all a matter of science. Let me be your guide and companion for this part of the journey. I got to financial freedom in 15 years. I can get you there in five. There's a way. And I can make the journey faster and far more enjoyable. They say that when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. So let me take you back to the drawing board. But first, pause and review. Part two, the blueprint. The seven pillars and the formula for success. There are seven assets you can use to build wealth. Only seven assets. We met them in the forward, and I've added a reminder of what an asset means to a wealth builder. An asset is something you own that is not you. It puts money into your bank account while you are asleep, and you can pass that money on to the people you care about or good causes. It does not end because you are not there. And the seven assets are home equity, pensions, investments, property portfolio, business, intellectual property, and joint ventures. Since there are only seven assets, this leads me to an important scientific point. Wealth building is a science, period. It's not rocket science, it's applied science. Learn the process and then apply it. Going back to the drawing board means going back to basics. The basics are clear. Assets build wealth because assets build ongoing cash flow. Cash flow is the fuel for the life you want to lead. Like any economist, I love a good formula. I also recognise that all scientists love formulae for their processes. Einstein is the name most readily associated with being a scientist. So let's be like Einstein when it comes to developing a formula for building wealth. How's your maths? Do you want the easy version or the full version? Einstein himself had something to say about this kind of knowledge. If you cannot explain it simply enough, you do not understand it well enough. So let's go for the simple, clear, easy version. The formula is AI is equal to or greater than E, which is equal to a smiley face. That sounds good, doesn't it? But what does it mean? I chose to use something like Einstein's equations because he inspired me with his following definition of insanity, which he said was doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Do you remember my question about what you've done in the past five years to build wealth? If you haven't done much, are you going slowly insane? Using the 20th century processes in the 21st century is also a form of insanity. It's just like doing the same stuff and expecting a better result. Doing nothing and expecting your level of wealth to change significantly is also insane. We need to get different results now because the rules have changed forever. Wealth builders do things differently. They use an alternative set of formulae to take an applied scientific approach to wealth building. They recognise that just finding a faster and better way to travel is still going to get the same results, just quicker. Without the right strategy, this could even mean finding a quicker result to the wrong destination. So here's the formula again, where AI represents asset income and E represents expenditure. And the smiley face means you and me as a happy wealth builder. So where asset income is equal to or greater than expenses then we've got happiness. So let me ask you a really big question. What sum would you need each month to live the kind of life you'd like to live? This would give us a figure to focus on, our asset income. AI in the formula, asset income, is one of the most important figures you'll ever decide upon. It answers the big question that I ask all my clients. What sum would you need each month to live the kind of life you'd like to live? Imagine being financially independent. There's a figure attached to that concept. Think about it. Just picture a figure. Is it £2,000 a month? Is it 5000 7000 10000 20000 Don't worry about the tax aspect. We'll come to that later. Everybody has a number and everybody is different. So what's your number? This figure you'll have in mind is the sum of income you'll need each month to fuel the financially independent lifestyle you'd like. Once you've got your number, we can use the financial GPS 
to find out how well you are on track and where adjustments need to be made. The number you choose is not critical, it's simply part of the process. You can change that number. And once you've chosen that number, we can move on. But first, I'm going to challenge you to think about a bigger number. I'm interested in abundance. It's a powerful concept. It's a concept that has plenty of capacity for sharing generously. Being a wealth builder is never going to be just about an individual. It's always about the other lives that the wealth builder influences. So it's good to think in terms of abundance. Abundance appeared twice in our original definition of wealth itself. In fact, one of the biggest questions you could ever ask yourself is totally dependent upon financial abundance. If money was no object, how would you live your life? Abundance is a life without limits. What does financial abundance mean to you? It helps to think about four words, have, be, do and give. Have, what would be the material aspects of financial abundance for you? What would you have? Be. How would you be in yourself? Do. How would you spend your time? Give. What legacy would you contribute? Okay, to get there, there are three stages. Firstly, financial security. Secondly, financial independence. Thirdly, financial abundance. This means that on the journey, there will be, in fact, three figures of asset income to aim for. It is one journey, but with three distinct stages. These are the milestones. Firstly, financial security, where is the stage where your asset income matches your basic expenses. You can get by, but your choices will be limited. Stage two, financial independence, the stage where your asset income replaces your current income. This will open up new worlds of opportunities for you. You will have lots of choices. Stage three, financial abundance, the state where asset income is far over and above your expenses so that you can choose to invest your time, your energy, your resources in any project or lifestyle you like or choose. It's a life without limits. You will have unlimited choice and the ability to help others on their journey too. Reaching the point of financial security is the critical moment on your wealth building journey. This is the point at which you are truly free to choose how much further you would like to go. You can also make a vital career choice. If you've got a job you don't like, that chapter can close. You can now write a new script for your future. You can do something you want to. You will be changing career from a position of strength. You will be changing from the basis of a firm foundation, not wishful thinking. Onwards and upwards. From here on up, you can choose financial independence. Or you can aim for the stars. Trust me on this, it doesn't matter where you're starting from. The journey to financial security is as much fun as the next stages of the journey on to financial independence and then abundance. But you'll get such a buzz from your progress that like most people, you want to keep on progressing. A professional at one of the property portfolio networks I share with put it eloquently the other day. She said getting my first properties was exciting. But now it's the networking with the like-minded people that I get even more of a buzz from. And I can give a contribution back. She has discovered that sharing is a key aspect of abundance. Abundance is another word for true wealth. A concept that embraces choice, sharing and a fully meaningful and satisfying life. That's worth working towards, isn't it? Since my definition of financial independence is where asset income equals current income... I challenge the dominant paradigm about final salary schemes. Consider that most people have been programmed to expect a final salary scheme that's equivalent to two-thirds of their final salary. Why would anybody be content with this? This is a book about wealth, about freedom and about abundance. Two-thirds of your best income doesn't fit anybody's idea of wealth. Less is less. Why settle for an income where you've lost a third? This was a trade-off people were willing to make in the 20th century. We're not in the 20th century anymore. Now you're going to live longer and you'll want to do lots more than your predecessors did. An active retirement is your bright future and for that you'll need more resources, not less. So let's review and have a call to action. Before we move on, let's make sure firstly you've got a figure of your desired monthly asset income in your mind. Be bold. Stick figures on both financial independence and financial abundance. You can always revise these later. 
And there's an answer required to the next big question, without which you can't fully track your progress. When do you want to be financially secure? That's your first milestone. Place a time frame on your plan. Then you can work the plan. Without this, it's just wishful thinking. I believe you're ready to put a time frame on financial independence too. That's what I did and it worked. So do you want to be there in 10 years, 7 years, 5 years, less than 5? What level of commitment can you invest in your future? I challenge you to decide before you go any further that you're ready now to be a wealth builder and make this commitment within a specific time frame. This is your how much by when. And when you're ready to make that commitment, we would be delighted to send you your own personalised new Declaration of Financial Independence. This is the declaration that you can sign in the presence of a witness that draws a line in the cement and says, from this day on, I'm working the plan. Now, before we move forwards, let's pause. Let's think about right direction, right vehicle. What could possibly stop you at this pivotal point on your journey? You could. You could stop you. I've concluded so far that it's insane for you to think you can make a significant difference to your level of wealth on your own. It's insane to look back over the last five years and to think that if you've taken no action, anything will change for the better. It won't. So in this high-tech, fast-moving, information age, what is it? that would keep holding you back? What could possibly trap you in this cycle of insanity? Just in case it's not completely obvious that doing what you did before isn't working well enough, consider this analogy. You need a vehicle for the most exciting journey of your life. It's a journey with a wonderful objective. The destination is magnificent. You need to choose the right vehicle. How about a Sinclair C5? The Sinclair C5 was one of the most forward-thinking innovations of all time. It was invented and developed by Sir Clive Sinclair, former chairman of Mensa, the High IQ Society, a British treasure, a peer of the realm. It was a stunning realisation of fresh thinking. It has, in fact, acted as a catalyst for the development of all manner of hybrid and electric vehicles, which may yet free our cities from pollution. But it didn't catch on. Why? because it's not built for long journeys. It's not built safely enough to protect the passenger on today's busy motorways, or even in frantic suburban rush hour traffic. It's a vehicle suited to an environment that largely doesn't exist. And yet many people are driving a financial vehicle that is the equivalent of a Sinclair C5. What's more, because the environment has changed, they're doing the equivalent of driving their C5 on the M4 motorway. Wrong vehicle, dangerous environment, and only room for one on board. It's not going to work. So why would you do such a crazy thing? Well, it isn't your fault. Millions of people are driving their C5 financial plan on the M4 direction of life. I chose the C5 because I respect the genius of its design and intent, and also because it reminds me of the five points beginning with C that have caused millions to get caught driving one. Just because everybody else seems to be doing something doesn't make it right, or a good idea, does it? So what are the five C's? Well, they are consumed, capacity, complexity, confusion, and catalyst. Only one of those C's is good, and we've met the good one already. So let's work through them and what they may well mean for you and I. Consumed. Most people are consumed by the requirements of their jobs or running their businesses. This is the number one frustration professionals share with me. They are too busy. If you are too busy, the last thing you want to do after a hard day's work is sit down and review your finances. Can you imagine coming home and spending the evening reviewing your pensions? No, I didn't think so. The result is that it's hard work to break out of the loop of working flat out and then being too tired to reflect and research enough to develop an effective financial strategy for your future. Before you know it, you're stuck in a C5. The busyness is not your fault. It's a consequence of living under the paradigm of a work income. It's a consequence of living in the information age and not filtering this information for what works for you. That's why you need a mentor to save you time and direct your attention. 
Doing a job well or running a business requires a lot of time and intellectual property. If you are labouring under the 20th century way of thinking, you've most likely received income in return for the work you've delivered. Your IP, your intellectual property, has been your ideas, your ability to think, your skills and your expertise. You've delivered this intellectual property over time and that delivery mechanism, time, has completed the transaction. In many ways then, a job is your intellectual property plus your time, the time it takes to deliver your intellectual property. Putting in more time and intellectual property should logically lead to doing a better job. Millions understand this logic, so they invest long hours sacrificing family and social time in order to stay competitive. This leads inevitably to the second C, capacity and the loss of it. Let's have a look at capacity then. If you're giving the best hours of your day, your best ideas and your best energy to the job, it follows that you've little capacity left for anything else. That was okay in the 20th century because the long-term rewards made the commitment almost worthwhile. When there was a final salary pension scheme to look forward to, or a personal pension with an annuity rate of 15%, you could put up with giving your life and soul to the company. When the report on your pension performance came in, you could even get away with filing it away in a drawer and forgetting about it. It was being looked after. You didn't need to get involved. In fact, you were so busy, you didn't have the capacity to get involved. There just wasn't enough time, energy or education. You weren't motivated to take an interest. Surprise, surprise, you ended up in a C5. Complexity. It's time for your wake-up call. The world has suddenly got more complex. I say suddenly, but actually it was an observable process. You simply wouldn't have noticed it. It took you by surprise. It took nearly everybody by surprise. It wasn't your fault. You followed the same signs as everyone else. You followed the same advice, but you ended up on the M4 in your one-person C5, just like many others. It's not a nice place to be, though, in a C5 on the M4, is it? In the 20th century, you could provide for the future with just three key assets, a home and the equity it represented, a pension and savings or investments. Looking after the processes that built and protected these assets could be delegated to other people. Your pensions were looked after by your employer and the state. Your home was looked after by the mortgage companies, who often covered your insurance requirements too. Your savings and investments were looked after by the bank and sometimes by an IFA. You didn't have to be involved. It was simple, not complex. The simplicity has gone for three reasons. Firstly, we've seen that current low annuity rates make it highly unlikely for you to be able to build a pot that would deliver a return on investment similar to a final salary pension scheme. Secondly, the stock market has demonstrated that it is not consistently offering a high enough return on investment to rely on it alone to build wealth. And thirdly, bank interest rates are too low, affecting so many savers and confidence in banks is at an all-time low. I can hear that wake-up call, can you? It sounds like being hands-off is no longer a sensible option. In the 21st century, you need to take more responsibility. You need to get hands-on. You need to take some action. You need to take control. Confusion. With being consumed, working at full capacity and facing complexity, the next C is inevitable. Confusion. This, for many people, is the end of the journey. Confused people always say no. Are you going to say no, or will you choose the empowering option? It's going to mean changing direction. It's going to mean changing a lot of things that seemed to work before. So, catalyst. It's the smallest word of the five Cs, but the only one with the power to move us forward towards the future, and in the right direction. Just as Sir Clive C5 was a catalyst for the current development of electric cars, so you also can use the current situation as a catalyst. It may not be your fault that you're facing such a complex scenario, but it is your life, and you can certainly use the challenges as a catalyst for positive action. It's your choice. So where are you now? If you're willing to stay with the analogy for a little longer, 
you could well be on the M4 in your C5. The shift is that you're developing a stronger and stronger catalyst to drive the chemistry of change. You already want to change vehicles. What else is there to consider? So let's think about changing your vehicle and something even more fundamental. It's clear that the C5 was a good vehicle, predicting the future need to develop alternative transport. But it's the wrong vehicle for here and now. Being a wealth builder is as much about who you are as about what you do. You will be positively transformed in the process of wealth building. You'll be a different person. Many wealth builders find they have a new level of energy and motivation. Wealth builders are people with a purpose. They have a strategy. They possess a sense of direction. They exude confidence. They are fun to be around. Without being too dramatic, they also have a sense of destiny. This sense of direction and destiny is very much centred on each wealth builder's definition of what wealth means to them. Once wealth is defined, they can choose the right vehicle for their journey. They can plan the route and identify the milestones that will demonstrate their progress. They can decide how long they want to take, how much, by when. And so they can set the pace. Then they can check their financial GPS to see where they are now. And do you know what? Many wealth builders make the biggest discovery so far. Oops, wrong motorway. What if you were on the M4? The M4 is the perfect motorway if you want to head west or east. It's even called the M4 corridor. It's that direct. But what if you really want to head north? If you want to head north, the M4 is the wrong motorway. No amount of accelerating along the M4 corridor is going to get you north you'll be trapped in that corridor, just going faster in the wrong direction. So let's think about the proactive you. New vehicle, new direction, new you. In the 21st century, you can no longer be a passenger, and you cannot be without a passenger. You can't be an individual driving a C5. You need a new vehicle with space at least for partners, your mentors for each stage of the journey, and later on, your partners in joint ventures. You may also need to re-evaluate your destination and so your direction. You can no longer be passive. Free the new you, the proactive you. Stephen Covey is famous for bringing the concept of true north into the consciousness of many professionals. True north is about being true to yourself, your ambitions and your values. The way the whole world was going in the 20th century was okay, but the world has changed. In the 21st century, you must be true to yourself and head true north. To do that, you need a better strategy. To do that, you need ongoing guidance on your progress and coaching on how to avoid hazards, your financial GPS. To get north, you'll need another route. Road hazards ahead, that's the essence of the M4. Most people approach me on a tactical level. They say, Kevin, should I put my money in a pension or in an ISA? That's a tactical question. It's like asking me, Kevin, how can I go faster? This is a waste of energy if you're on the wrong motorway. You just get to the wrong destination faster and waste more fuel. Worse still, you can end up more frustrated. To get a better question, we need a better strategy. Then the tactics make sense in the framework of the strategy. The strategy begins with your clear how much by when, and then builds around the blueprint I'm going to share with you. And here's the danger. Getting hooked into tactics will just keep you stuck along the M4 corridor going east-west. Once I've captured your imagination with the full strategy, you will always be heading north. Every tactic will move you forward, northwards. And as a Geordie, Newcastle sounds good to me. North is a good place. North is up. Let's be aware of the danger of moving sideways. Just getting hooked into tactics without a strategy. Don't get distracted. True North and true wealth. This will not be a strategy I will impose upon you, but it is a frame of mind you will need to make the most of what follows. It will be your strategy. It may include a vision for your children or for your chosen causes or for helping other people along the way. It will include other aspects of your personal definition of wealth. Just as there is true North, so there is also true wealth, but only you can define what that means for you. For me, true wealth has a distinctive character. It has to include sharing and involving. These four aspects are programmed into my personal GPS. Financial abundance, the fuel for the life I choose to lead. True north, the direction I want to head in 
that's congruent with my values, sharing with others who want to head in the same direction, and building a legacy for my children and my chosen causes. Just as a GPS needs several satellite reference points to navigate accurately, these four points inform my choices. So, if I choose a liability when I can choose an asset, I'm off course. If a business or personal decision violates my personal values, I'm off course. If I make a decision to keep knowledge to myself, I'm off course. If what I'm doing is not building a better future for my children or chosen courses, I'm off course. No compromise is necessary. This is the way of integrity. It is the opposite of complexity. It makes life simpler. Now is the time for this new strategy and direction. Now is the time for connection through a community. Why? Well, all the historical connections are falling and tumbling. Do you remember your personal bank manager? Some people still have one, but how connected do they feel with them? Instead, we live in a computer says no world. I hate banks. Adopt my strategy and you won't need to borrow from the bank. The current paradigm is up for challenge, even by those currently working in it. Bankers and traditional financial advisors. There are pockets of people who are sharing. This is another aspect of being in changing times. The growth of peer-to-peer, like crowdsourcing and crowdfunding, is evidence that people are bypassing traditional connections such as the banks. There is a revolution taking place. The concept of being a shareholder has taken a new direction, but one that needs a strategy and a firm hand at the wheel. Like I said, you cannot be passive. You must take control. In conclusion then, choosing a wealth-building mentor. So far, I've not found anyone who's sharing using a comprehensive strategy. Part of my strategy includes consistently sharing with charities too, who are aligned with a vision. It's time to share. It's time to build together. Almost everybody who is working in the field of finance is also working in a single focus silo. The bank will do loans, the financial advisor will talk about products, the property management company will talk about saving you time and money. They will offer you a product, a service or a course in a single dimension. What's needed, but what's missing, is a strategy that is holistic, a strategy that takes your finance and gives it a 360 degree view. My strategy will show you the interconnecting paths. It won't come at you from the point of protected self-interest. This is the message of the wealth building community, taking the holistic, strategic view and route rather than the tactical, silo-focused path. Most people who are trying to grow their wealth in any way will seek a mentor. This is good. The challenge is to find a new kind of mentor whose grasp can span the multi-pillar approach. Over 25 years, I've spoken to thousands of people and they all say that the mentorship they get is singular in focus. There are dedicated experts out there who are property mentors, even down to specialising in specific aspects of property. One might be a rent-to-rent mentor, another an HMO mentor, and that targeted focus on specific knowledge for a specific outcome is excellent, but it's no longer enough. If the overall process of wealth building is about building wealth in pillars, not building wealth in tactics, you will need a mentor who's got that ability to see the whole process. This kind of mentor can see the interconnecting paths I've mentioned and how they interact with one another. This is vital because every pillar can become a source of finance for every other pillar. It means that you won't get compounding in just one direction. You'll get compounding upon compounding upon compounding upon compounding upon compounding. You might think I'm exaggerating the point, but I'm not. The extra result achieved by having that breadth of knowledge is transformation. That's what I've been able to bring to the party because I've built my wealth in seven pillars, not in one. I can give you evidence that the cumulative result is nothing less than transformational, not merely incremental. So whilst I may not have the full tactical genius of someone in a specific pillar, I know enough about it to pull the best expert in to contribute to your strategic wealth plan. In this way, you can get the benefit of a both-and approach rather than an either-or dilemma. You can have both the strategic overview and the special knowledge required to make the best choices. What is unique and different about the wealth-building process is that it doesn't drive you down a single track. 
In fact, those who continue to play a tactical game will rapidly be overtaken by those who choose the multi-pillar approach, for many reasons, including the impact of compounding on compounding. Single tracks are only appropriate when they contribute to the whole. Additionally, when they are approached in the context of the broader vision, your progress will be far more rapid. With a wealth-building mentor to guide you, you won't be seduced by experts in a particular track who seek to add expertise sale to expertise sale, tempting you to spend more money. Unfortunately, I have to say I have met many people who have invested a small fortune in learning expertise that they are not yet in a position to utilise. It would have been far better for them to invest the same amount of time, energy and money in wealth building activities that move them forward on their journey and that developed assets. The central responsibility for a wealth building mentor is building a relationship with you for your wealth. This kind of mentor has enough knowledge in all areas to help you build your wealth plan and to help you judge your progress while continuing to guide you strategically. So let's think about the new declaration of financial independence. I'd like to share with you the contents of this important document that all members of the community of wealth builders sign. It's a declaration of their commitment to this exciting journey. Let me read to you the declaration. It has your name at the top. It says, the new declaration of financial independence. It begins with, I am totally committed to becoming completely financially independent and to sharing the following seven wealth builder values. Firstly, taking full responsibility for my own financial future in a hands-on, accountable way. Secondly, conducting my life and my business in a way that demonstrates the highest integrity. Thirdly, investing time in building lasting relationships. Fourthly, actively sharing the knowledge and lessons I've learned along the way. Fifthly, helping others who are like-minded and on the same path. Sixthly, keeping value within the community. Seventhly, passing on a legacy together with the principles and wisdom to maintain and expand it. Now, as I've said, we can send you one with your name on it, a personalised declaration, which you sign in the presence of a witness, and then you send us a photo proudly holding up your signed declaration as drawing that line in cement saying, from this day, these commitments are consciously active in my wealth building journey. So as I bring this recording to a close, this first recording, I have to ask you, would you sign this declaration? Are you ready right here, right now to take action? If you are, get in touch with us so we can support you on your journey. Our support will begin with sending you your very own declaration personalised with your name. If you are in 100% alignment with our values, your path to membership begins by simply signing this in the presence of that witness and then sending us a picture of you with your witness holding up your signed declaration. As part of the process, we'd like your permission then to share your commitment and your picture on social media, celebrating with you and our growing community. Everyone who publicly shares our values by signing the declaration and sending the picture can join us as an associate member. Associate members get to keep up to date with our latest educational and inspirational posts. Full members get to harness the power of connection with other trusted members of our community. As a full member, you'll have your own profile on our membership site where other like-minded people can find you and connect. Other resources in this series will go into more specific details and so will avoid leaving your future to chance. I trust now that you realise neither being consumed nor lacking capacity, complexity nor confusion can stop you once you know where you want to get to and once you activate your catalyst to begin the journey. If you choose not to be passive but rather be proactive, nothing can stop you. I look forward to travelling onwards together. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget that we are constantly updating our resources inside the Wealth Builders membership site to help you create, build and protect your wealth. Head over to wealthbuilders.co.uk slash membership right now for free access. That's wealthbuilders.co.uk slash membership.